with all of this in mind what i want to do is take a quick look at some examples of applications and architectures before we get into the problem of actual multi objective optimization right so i'm going to sort of run through this fairly quickly because there is not real you know fundamental concepts involved over here this is sort of more to give you a flavor for what kind of applications we could run and so on the first simplest application or a very simple application would be something like audio filtering right and the questions that we can ask are you know the kind of constraints that i'm giving here are i have a sample rate of 48 kilohertz each sample is 16 bits and i basically want to put it through a 30 tap fir filter right so what does that mean it basically means that i will basically be taking samples pushing them through this tap delay line over here then doing a lot of multiplications right and additions right if i take multiplications to be the more complicated part of the computation then i can sort of try and estimate how much computation is actually required over here So the first question, if I ask, what is the bit rate? At what rate are bits actually coming into the system? It essentially, comes down to something like forty-eight thousand samples per second multiplied by sixteen bits. Right? This is the number of bits per second that the system is processing. Right? So why is this relevant? Because it sort of gives me a picture for how much capacity, how much storage, what kind of transfer of data is required in the system. the 48000 samples per second is also sufficient in order to get a picture of what is actually happening but the into 16 also gives you know captures the fact that each sample itself is 16 bits how many computations right so this is the actual computation rate and the computation rate essentially becomes 48000 multiplications per second into each output the simplest way to look at it is in order to generate one output i need to have 30 multiplies right and i will be generating 48000 outputs per second so 48000 times 30 is the number of multiply accumulate operations that are going to get done okay. so this is still roughly in the range of you know less than a million multiplications per second okay. and how many memory accesses this depends on how i have actually you know constructed the entire system am i directly implementing this using shift registers or am i putting it into some kind of a memory block reading writing from the memory am i using a dsp system which actually has to store the values in uh, you know maybe on chip memory and then do the computations and so okay so this is an example of a low end application one which does not have too much computation but still you can do these estimates right sort of get the numbers that you more complex example something that can come up for example anybody who is working on let's say a 5g uh, communication system could be using some kind of ofdm orthogonal frequency division multiplexing right and this chain that i have over here you probably can't read uh, the stuff that's there in the blocks but you know it doesn't matter it's just sort of representative the type of computations that are happening how many bits per frame are required in order to get to 20 megabits per second right the information that i am giving you is basically that we have 250 microseconds per frame right this as you can do the math will basically convert to 4000 frames per second right so what exactly is a frame in the context of a communication system essentially what we are saying is that if this is the time axis we have some set of samples which constitutes a frame and this is frame 1 and immediately after that we basically have frame 2 and so on right so we have a sequence of frames coming one after another this is purely at the physical layer so the content of the frame how we are putting headers all of that is not my concern at the moment right all that i'm saying is the spacing between frames is 250 microseconds which translates into 4000 frames per second which means that if i want to achieve 20 megabits per second i can do the computation how many bits do i need to have per frame right so you can do the math you can basically work through it 20 megabits per second divided by 4000 frames per second okay this question of overall bit rate is a little bit more 
tricky. It's not, uh, you know, what I meant over here was just in terms of the amount of data that's actually passing through the system, right? But another part of the computation, which is actually quite interesting, and this is the kind of computation that I would like to sort of stress upon as we go through this course, is to say, can I estimate how much computation at a sort of high level over here, right? So if I look at this, basically what I can see is that one OFDM symbol over here, right? So let's say one of these frames basically corresponds to nine OFDM symbols, right? What that means is that this in turn looks like it can be broken up internally into nine blocks, right? One, two, three, up to nine. Each of these is a corresponds to a 512 point FFT, but in practice it is not just going to be 512 samples. It will also have some cyclic prefixes and so on and so forth added on to it. The important point is for every such frame I will need to compute 9 512 point FFTs. Okay? That in turn will tell me how many FFTs per second I need to do. And once I have that much information, the question then becomes, now can I estimate what kind of hardware I need, right? And the thing is, if I have FFT units, some kind of specialized FFT hardware that is capable of doing one FFT within 50 microseconds, then I can ask the question, how many such FFT units do I need? Do I actually need nine such FFT units in order to do nine FFTs? Or can I manage with one? Or you know, how much am I going to need in order to do the computation? So if we sort of go forward over here, we can also translate that into a computation of how many multiply accumulates do I need to compute per second, right? So if I look at the numbers, basically what it comes down to is, if I have 5,000 data bits per frame, I will be able to achieve 20 megabits per second because 5,000 data bits per frame into 4,000 frames per second is 20 megabits per second, right? So that is the kind of computation that I'm interested in. And one thing that I want to stress upon over here and hopefully you know, we'll, we'll be making a point of this through the course is that you should be able to do these rough estimates as quickly as possible, right? I am not particularly concerned about accuracy over here. Now, instead of 5,000, if you had told me that it is, I mean, in this case, it turns out the number is exactly 5,000, which is great. But if the number was actually 4,500 and you had told me it's 5,000, I'm going to say, okay, fine, I'll accept it good enough for the kind of estimates that we need to do. The overall bitrate, like I said, there are nine OFDM symbols, each with 512 points, 4000 frames per second, and each sample is a complex IQ data, right? Which means 16 plus 16, 32 bits. Okay, so this is how we could estimate, for example, what is the number of bits that is going, in, going through the system in a regular computation. This is not very accurate for the simple reason, like I told you, the actual OFDM symbols will also have some cyclic prefixes. Uh, there will be some preambles that are added on to the entire frame and so on. So the number of bits is probably likely to be a bit more, but as a rough, end, uh, rough estimate, this is good enough for me. Okay. Number of FFTs per second, very easy. 4,000 frames per second, nine FFTs per frame. Right, so 36,000 FFTs per second need to be performed. Now, the interesting thing is I need to perform 9 FFTs every 250 microseconds. And if I can do 50 microseconds per FFT, it means that one such unit can actually do 5 FFT computations within 250 microseconds. Right? And if I had 2 such units, I should be able to do 10 FFTs within 250 microseconds. So what this tells me is that in this way, I can start budgeting. I can start creating an estimate of how much hardware I will actually require in the final design. Okay. Similarly, I can go forward to the multiply accumulates per second. Once again, nine FFTs, 4,000 frames per second. And one FFT is of complexity n log n 512 into log 512, which is basically log to base two. So this number is nine. And this 4 that I have over here is some kind of a constant of complexity. Essentially, 
I mean, you have probably come across this expression that, you know, the F50 has complexity O of n log n. What that actually means in practice is that it has roughly some constant, not roughly, it has some constant into n log n multiplications per second. Okay. So, a typical value for that constant is 4. So, basically what we end up with is 4 into 512 log 512 into 9 into 4000. So that is a way of estimating the total number of multiply accumulates that we need per second. So this was for the OFDM receiver, right? I just wanted to go through the computation and show you what OFDM was. The next example that I had put up last time was AlexNet. This is a neural network. Essentially what we take is an image of size 224 cross 224 and 3, that is basically the RGB channels, right, is fed into a number of different computations. The computations themselves are written here, right, so the first layer, for example, uses something called a 11 cross 11 cross 3 kernel, right, so this is the kernel size, this is the stride, and this is the total number of kernels in layer 1, right. Right, which basically corresponds to this. Okay. Now, you don't need to know what kernels are, how they are actually computed. Well, how they are computed, the only thing that you need to know about that is the fact that this 11 into 11 into 3 is the number of multiplications that need to be done in order to generate each output. Okay. And then some 11 into 11 into 3 additions, uh, multiplications followed by some additions is what is used in order to compute each output. The stride value is used in order to sort of move the kernel across the image. 48 and 48 are, essentially it's a total of 96 different kernels, but 48 plus 48 it's split out because it actually does it in two separate parallel streams. Okay. Now, what is the point of all of this? The reason why I'm bringing this up is because I want to sort of convey what is the kind of complexity that is involved in recognizing one single image using let's say an architecture like AlexNet. Okay. So based on that, we can now try and estimate how many computations are needed. We probably can get an, uh, get an idea that this number is going to be large, right? Because it's already, I can see 11 into 11 into 3 for generating one output pixel from the first layer. And how many such pixels do I have? This 224 divided by the stride size 4, right? So 55 into 55 into this number 96 is what I am going to end up as a number of output pixels or feature uh, maps, right? Feature elements. So that clearly looks like it's going to be a fairly large number. So what I have done over here is basically gone through that entire computation. And what you can see is that if you actually do that math, you will find that, you know, this is basically 200 million operations at the first layer. Right, 210 million, right? What kind of operations? Multiplications. And because of the way that neural networks work, typically this is done in floating point. It's not absolutely necessary. There are ways of doing it in fixed point. Now, what are the differences between floating and fixed point? We'll get to that in next week's uh, class. But for the time being, let's, you know, not worry about that. Let's just assume we are doing it in floating point. So the interesting thing is, you know, this is already 200 million, then 440 million and so on. You add everything up, it goes upwards of one and a half billion, right? 1.5 into 10 power 9 floating point operations per image, right? I'm approximating it to about 2 gigaflops per image, right? So why am I doing this computation? Because I want to be able to get a quick estimate of given a compute, compute requirement like this, what kind of hardware is needed or conversely given a hardware is it capable of performing a certain computation or not okay. so neural networks in the last few years have seen a lot of uh, research and uh, people have done a lot of profiling uh, implementation on various different architectures and as part of that one of the things is there is also a set of benchmarks that was created and is available on github right 
uh, they're basically CN benchmarks. And the interesting thing is we have estimated roughly two gigaflops as the number of computations required for AlexNet. This, the numbers on this website are from around 2016, when the best known computing power in one card, so to say, was the NVIDIA Pascal Titan X. Okay? And it had an estimated peak throughput. Remember, this is peak right, of 10 teraflops. This is per second, right? 10 into 10 power 12 floating point operations per second. And it turns out that on this particular piece of hardware, one AlexNet inference, that is this recognition of one image, all the computation that I showed you earlier, would get done within 5 milliseconds. Now, 10 teraflops, 5 milliseconds, should have given us the ability to do 50 gigaflops, right? So, there's a bit of terminology, so potential confusion over here in my use of the word flops. It could either mean just floating point operations or floating point operations per second. Right? Usually from the context it will be clear. In this case, in both of them, the 2 gigaflops and the 50 gigaflops are not per second. They are just number of operations. Okay. My point that I am trying to make over here is that AlexNet actually required something like 2 gigaflops. Based on the peak performance of this chip, we could have done 50 gigaflops within 5 milliseconds. Where did the remaining 48 gigaflops go? And the fact of the matter is, this is not that this is a particularly badly written code or something of the sort. My estimates may also be off by a little bit and I have not sort of looked carefully. I, I did not run these benchmarks, I have not got exact estimates over here. But the reason I bring this up is to make it clear that very often the peak performance is very different from the actual achievable performance. A large part of the reason for that is the fact that the peak performance, the number of multiply accumulates or multiplications that a card can do per second are maximized when everything required by the card is just sitting in its own memory, right, on chip, preferably inside the registers, inside the floating point unit. In practice, that is never the case. What ends up happening is you need to read image data, you need to write out the feature data, and each of those is going into and out of memory. In the worst case, it's actually going out to device memory, but even in the best case, it is actually coming from some local memory, which is not very efficient. Okay. So when we take all of that into account, it turns out that you know uh, this is uh, the actual performance that you get will be much lower than the practical uh, than the peak theoretical performance. 